On November 10th, uh, IDF Major Reserves um, Moshe Yedidia Leiter was with his soldiers in the northern Gaza Strip, and they had located and were about to inspect the opening of a tunnel, a uh, terror tunnel of Hamas's, and uh, it worked out that the tunnel was booby-trapped, and uh, Major Leiter and his soldiers were killed. Um, I think two more were critically wounded. And um, it, it was a major tragedy, first of all, because uh, it's a tragedy when any of our soldiers are hurt or certainly killed, and also because Major Leiter was uh, an extraordinary man, father of six, just uh, completing his medical services after uh, medical studies after 15 years, I think, in the Army. Um, and for me, it, it hit hard for many reasons, both because of who I learned what I learned of Moshe Yedidia Leiter, and also because he's the son of an old friend of mine, uh, Yechia Leiter, who I've had really the privilege of knowing for definitely over 20 years. Um, and I met, I visited uh, Yechia during the time that he was sitting Shiva for his son, and I told him that I really wanted to come have him here on the Carolyn Glick Show to tell us uh, about his son and to give his message because I think I was so affected by it I couldn't even speak. So I'm very uh, happy and feel very privileged as well because Yechiel is joining us today uh, on the Carolyn Glick Show uh, to talk to us about his son and about the war and um, and the issues of our day. So first of all, thank you so much, Yechiel, for joining me today on the Carolyn Glick Show. And again, um, I have no words except that you should be consoled among the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem for your extraordinary loss. And I know that I'm joined by millions and millions of people in expressing my condolences to you and your family for your son, Moshe. Well, thank you, Caroline. It's good to be with you. We do go back a long time. Yes. I remember your work in the prime minister's office in the days of you David Gary <laughs> Oh, yeah. lo even longer than I thought. Okay, yeah. yes. Well, you know, it takes on a new meeting when you say old friends now. You know, we're, we're moving on. Yeah. Uh, I did have a son that was 39 years old, father of six. And um, he actually made me feel young all the time. Ah, well, children do that. Because he was uh, just so into life. He was so alive. Wasted no time and did so many things. So... Um, Try to follow his footsteps now. I have a, I have a big undertaking for, for the future. A huge charge he left me, you know, to uh, forget about retirement or anything like that and uh, kind of live the kind of ideals that he did. So tell me about. Carolina. Well, he was just, uh, he was, you know, the, the new generation of Israelis that are uh, creating a, uh, a future for the Jewish people. This is where history is happening. There's Jewish communities all over the world, but they're basically, at the end of the day, irrelevant to the Jewish future. I know it's a difficult thing for people to hear, but you know, um, we look at Jewish history and uh, those heroes in Jewish history that we celebrate today, uh, there were other Jews at the time, but they're just not counted, just not relevant. It's the people who really moved and operated and lived for the Jewish future that made the difference. That's who we celebrate. Uh, Jewish history is being played out here. Uh, this is what we waited for for 2,000 years. Come back home. And it's happening. It's real. You know, what our ancestors could just pray for. We're living. And Moshe, Moshe lived that. Uh, you know, he used to say uh, in, the, in the unit that he, he served in for 15 years in the Shaldag, which is uh, the equivalent, I guess, of the Delta Force in the United States, he actually trained with the Delta Force for a really? while, yeah. And um, he said, he said, uh, I asked him how that experience was, by the way, just in parentheses. And he said, uh, you know, Abba, they're real professional soldiers. They've got lots of brawn, but we've got incredible brains. <laughs> it is. And when we put it together, we're we're good. We're real good. Um, so um, he, he used to say that uh, when when he went out to navigate, uh, they take. 50, 60, 70 kilo on their backs uh, when they're navigating out in the middle of nowhere. And he said, I, I deal with it because I add weight. I said, what do you mean you add weight? 
He said, I take my grandparents on my shoulders. And when I take them on my shoulders, it lightens my weight, lightens the burden, because I know what I'm fighting for. I know what I'm training for. I know what I'm here for. Um, and that, by the way, you, you mentioned consolation. I, I appreciate it so much. Uh, you're coming to the Shiva and so many friends, old friends, young friends, new friends, uh, the government, ministers, um, officers Prime Minister. of the army, prime minister, the president, President Herzog. Uh, it was a tremendous show of uh, support uh, for Moshe and what he did. Um, but uh, um, I find consolation in the fact that, you know, I, my, my heart's divided. There's the private heart. There's the half of the heart which, which mourns my son. That, that heart usually is predominant at, at night when I stop my daily activities in his memory. But during the day, um, my, my other half of the heart, the heart of the Jewish people, the heart of uh, the general heart, you know, the people heart, the historical heart, um, allows me to find uh, consolation and uh, meaning uh, because without Moshe and his comrades, uh, without the IDF, uh, we wouldn't have a state. And we didn't have a state. Uh, the last will and testament of the Jewish people would have been a little boy in the Warsaw Ghetto with his hands raised. And uh, the IDF and the State of Israel put weapons in the hands of that little boy uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto, so that wouldn't be the end of Jewish history. No more surrender. And uh, in that, knowing that that's what Moshe gave his life for, there is there is consolation. Yeah, there is really a lot of consolation. And one of the things that's so remarkable about his story is just where you were said in, in your first sentence or something, that he just didn't waste any time. I mean, his life was so full of action. He was just a man of action. He did so many things. At the age of 39, six children. How many, 15 years of regular army yeah. service? In well, I, I actually spoke community. today to a high school of uh, 500 students, and they said, what's the single message that you uh, take from Moshe for the students? And I said, well, the value of time. Um, when he finished 15 years service, you know, he was supposed to become the commander of, of the unit of Sheldag. And he opted to go to med school instead because when um, there was a terrible, terrible tragedy in the Philippines in 2014, the earthquake, and uh, Israel sent a, a team uh, of doctors, a medical team, to treat the injured. And Moshe was in charge of the securing the delegation. Mm -hmm. You know, in the Philippines, there there are also Islamic extremists. Right. I think we'll talk about that too. But there was a fear that they would Mindanao. Attack. Yes, okay. there was a fear that they might attack the Israeli uh, delegation. So Moshe was in charge of security. And, you know, he came back and he said, look, I had an important job, but watching those doctors in the field hospital was where I decided I wanted to be. So after 15 years and being the uh, premier candidate to take over the entire unit, he decided to uh, go to med school. While he was in med school, he continued uh, serving in Miluim in reserve duty. Between 80 and 100 days a year, uh, he had his regular reserve unit, which belongs to the, um, the Northern Command, which is a very, very well-known, anybody who knows the history of the IDF, uh, it's called Utsbata Ish. It's the uh, Division of Fire, which is the, uh, uh, one of the key units in the Northern Command. And uh, he did reserve duty there and in his uh, original unit, the Sheldag unit as well. So it came out to 80, 90, 100 days a year Crazy. Uh, while going to med school. And at the same time, he was asked to do a Magad, the battalion commander, course. So he did that as well in addition to the Miluim days. And, and medical school. And medical school. But and he also had a job. To top it off, to top it off, he ran a program to integrate uh, young men from the Haredi community into an intelligence and cyber security unit in the army. So yeah, he didn't waste any time. He used to tell a favorite story that he heard about uh, Rabbi Steinsaltz mm -hmm. from the uh, Steinsaltz Talmud fame. And he was the head of his yeshiva also. Uh, yes, when he was in high school, yes. So he tells the story that he once went to the Lubavitcher Rebbe and uh, he said, I have to choose. I'm, I'm, I'm writing this commentary on the Talmud and I'm being stretched to the limit uh, what should I, what should I give up on? Uh, and the Rebbe told him to add something. Right. That's what I, my father used to say. Right, to he right. said, it, he said, if you want to have something done quickly, give it to somebody who's busy. Yeah. 
That's yeah. answer. So this is another twist. The Rebbe said, "Add so something." The Rebbe said, "Well, my dad." And Moshe and Moshe used to just he used to do that. He used to, you know, no matter how busy he was, and uh, just add another thing. Just add another thing, and and he did everything well. He did everything, you know, near perfection. As a father too, and as a husband, he was a wonderful husband, a very loving husband and, and, and parent. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's the first thing. There's many things I learned from him, but the first thing is uh, the value of time. Time is life. Yeah, he, he he lived many lives in his short life. I'd say he packed a lot in to the years that he had here. And when you look at, I mean, the war and what's happening in Gaza and how it, how it began with the greatest slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust, did did you? Did you talk about it with him? Did you talk about it with your other sons and sons-in-law about this war? A sense of want to talk but, about that a little bit. The circumstances. You know, you know Caroline, I, I didn't have a chance to talk to them because on October they were 8th, gone so fast. They, they, yeah, I mean, they were immediately drafted. Right. As a matter of fact, when the knock on the door came to inform me, it was twelve thirty on a Friday night, and um, you know when when I opened the door and I saw two officers, I knew that they were informing me that somebody close to me had been killed. And my only question was for a split second was what name would come out of their mouth because I had five sons and two sons-in-law in in, uh, in combat. Uh, it was the most harrowing experience imaginable. And, um, the most logical was for, you know, Moshe was, uh, if there's a division and in the division are eight battalions. And in eight battalions, there's dozens of squadrons. He was the point squadron, so he was basically leading the, the division, the tip of the tip of it. And as the division commander explained to me, he says it was the it was his squadron at the tip, and there was lighter at the tip of the squadron. Um, he led he led the forces, he led the entire division. He was uh, uh, had a, had a tremendous understanding of of, uh, of the map map of war. He understood war. He studied it. And uh, he was a field fox. Um, so the division commander didn't know him. He was a new division commander. They had three months. But everybody in his command post said, go ask later about the, the plans for the next week. And he told us how he got in his jeep and went to the point of where the squadron was and sat down with Moshe. And they actually came away with a new understanding of what the battlefield should look like. He was also, um, you know, he was a field fox, but he was also a, a soul fox. He understood the soul of people. He he was able to uh, pass criticism to his soldiers when necessary, but in a way that they felt uplifted and not derided or put down. Uh, he was a very just uplifting person in, in every regard, and that's why he was able to be in a unit with uh, guys from Kibbutzim, that uh, you know, ideologically and theologically were on one side, and he could also sit down with people from you know Satmar on the other side, theologically and ideologically, and be friends of both, and even even connect both. And that's why I think it's um, for me personally so imperative that I try to carry that uh, legacy forward. It's hard. I mean, it's it's not an easy. Oh, oh, he was he was he Dude. was a much bigger person than than I am. I mean, uh, there's a story about. Um, him uh, uh, sitting at a, at a um, meeting on Shabbat, a Kiddush, uh, you know, after the, the prayers on Shabbat morning. And um, uh, and there were a group of, uh, he was visiting with family, and the family had invited some uh, Satmar Hasidim to the, to the Kiddush. And uh, they immediately started at him about Zionism, about the state, and, and, uh, and they walked away friends. And, and um, he, he, I said, how did you do that? What, what did you do? He said, he said, look, Abba, the first five minutes, I understood that there was nothing to really argue about. So I took a book of Psalms. I opened it up. I said, let's sing. And in between each song, he poured a round of, uh, <laughs> schnapps. of schnapps. And, uh, you know, and, and they left uh, friends. And, you know, I would have used the bottle too, but probably in a different way, <laughs> you know, over their heads. He, he was able to do that. He'd look at a person and say, you know, well, well you know, he, he didn't, uh, he, he was a very... Non-judgmental. So he's trying to figure out how to connect with people, as opposed to whether I want to talk to them or not. Exactly. He was very, very non. He had. He was very principled. 
he was very rooted in his ideas and, and his beliefs, but he was able to toler tolerate other people's beliefs. And that's how he was able to get to people. That's how he's why he was such a, a successful officer. It's 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 a it's an a rare and extremely necessary skill in life. And most people don't have it. So yeah. I don't think I do. <laughs> you have other skills. Yes, we all Caroline. have our gifts, exactly. You know, one of the problems with um, with with trying to bring people together is that everything seems to pull people apart. And in a way, I mean, because the arguments that people have in this country, they, the, the ones that were pulling us apart over the year before or five years, depending on how you count the time, um, there were important questions. You know, it, it's not that people were arguing over pronouns or whatever. You know, I mean, like the issues of the day in Israel are always important. And at the at, and at the end, at the end, you see that they do go back to very existential questions about Israel's survival, about what we're doing here, about who we are as a people, so that it, it's not that the issues themselves are unimportant. It's it's whether we can figure out a way to talk about them that is based on on recognizing what joins us or whether we start a discussion from opposite sides of the stage and say we're just divided and let's see who can take the most. And But it, it's not easy to figure out how to do the former rather than the latter because people get very passionate about their their views and and the disagreements are real and they're over real things and and one of the things that I find uh, and and it's not as prominent in the war itself um, but there is a dual aspect to this war and it was of course by design by sadistic design on the part of Hamas which is the taking of the hostages and we right now meet on uh, on on Sunday night I think it's November twenty sixth um, where we're in a pause. And Hamas is getting resupplied, and uh, and the threats to our soldiers on the ground are mounting as a result of their immobility and Hamas's mobility. And and I mean, I look at it, and I just and and we're stuck because we want to get the hostages back, and all of this in order to get the hostages back, and. It's almost like the movie Saving Private Ryan, you know, like how many soldiers were killed on the way to trying to find Private Ryan, and how do you how do you balance the need to defeat Hamas, which is necessary for our national survival, and getting our hostages out without knowing how to locate them on our own? Um, it it's a it's a it's a major dilemma. That risks, and I think this is also by design on Yafia Sanwar, the monster leader of this whole whole thing. Um, it's he did it on purpose. I mean, when you look at the hostage deal as a, as a bereaved father, and also just as an Israeli thinker, you know how how do you look at it? How do you look at it without feeling torn apart? Oh, or despondent? No, it's definitely not despondent, but torn apart. I think if anybody looks at the situation, doesn't feel torn apart. They, uh, they've lost the ability to contend with moral quandary. This is a, this is a very, very, um, as you said, is existential, visceral issue. Um, you know, in, in, um, in uh, international relation theory and um, when uh, the study of ethics is, is, takes place, there's a classic case of Churchill at Coventry. Uh, you know, they, they, the British had cracked Enigma. They knew the German code, and they figured out that the Germans were about to, the Nazis were about to bomb Coventry. If I remember correctly, we're dealing with a city of about 100,000 people. And uh, no matter, if they would have bombed, there would have been thousands dead. But if Churchill decided to evacuate Coventry, the Germans would know that they cracked the code. The enigma. Cracked the enigma. And um, uh, many more would die ultimately if Britain was not able to terminate the war, and uh, you know it's it's a, what would you do? It's, I mean, it's a classic moral quandary. Churchill decided not to evacuate Coventry, and for that he was uh, pilloried 
by, by many of his colleagues. And historically, there are those who claim that it was a terrible mistake. But, uh, you know, here we have a situation where um, you, you have, you know, the, 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 the hostages being released, some of them. Um, and, and, and men and most and, of them not. And, and well, well, we don't know yet because the, the, there's, the, you know, the bottom line is we don't know most of what is going on. We don't know. When we know the, that 185 of them are not in the list, no matter how the we're list not, goes. We're not. Well, first of all, the, you know, the, the Red Cross may visit them today. Um, they did admit, as the prime minister said, that's part of the deal. So uh, we may get a, a real tally. There are rumors that that's not the, the there are many on that list that are no longer among the living uh, so there's there's an awful lot we don't know i think at the end of the day i would probably if i was a minister in the government i would probably vote for the agreement with all of the difficulties involved we may be on opposite sides of the table on this on this issue i would be very very uh, uh torn and uh asunder based on what i know you know without the intelligence data and the, primarily because um, th this war to be implemented to its final end, which is the destruction of Hamas, the destruction of Sinwar, and um, we, we need to hold on to the unity in the country. And if we stumble into a, another case of, um, of uh, you know, the, the, the Lebanon war, um, and the demonstrations in favor of the hostages become instead demonstrations against continuing the war, which could spin into that scenario, uh, it's going to be a lot worse. So it's a difficult decision. Um, I think we have to take into account all the concerns you mentioned about uh, Hamas rearming and do whatever we can to prevent that from happening. Uh, but we have to keep our eye on the long-term goal. And that's the total destruction of Hamas. How do we get there? That's the big question. Yeah, because one of the things, and I know that uh, you mentioned when we were talking before we started taping here, that uh, you know, you in your eulogy to your to your son Moshe, you had a message for President Biden, and actually, um, it's going to be appearing um, as a full page ad in the New York Times, where you were warning him against pressuring Israel, um, and we're. I want you to give us that message, but I also want to know, you know, we're facing, and we can go into it more afterwards, a massive pressure from the Americans. And, you know, and I don't know that they're goading or they're goaded by or both, um, you know, a chorus of international actors in the West, Qatar, uh, other terror-supporting regimes, Turkey, and uh, the UN, of course, um, uh, and, and everybody seems to be increasingly unified around the concept of preventing Israel from achieving our war aims. So, first of all, would you go into just give us give us a message that you gave to President Biden, and then we can go a little bit more into that. Oh, well, as I was on the on the family bus uh, going from my my son and daughter Laura's home in in the kibbutz near Keret Malachi in Surim, uh, and I was preparing my eulogy for my son. You know, I've been a Speechwriter for many uh, leaders. I never thought I'd be preparing a speech of my own for my son. We'll talk and, about um, that also. I um, you know, suddenly the thought occurred to me that there would be foreign uh, journalists and English speakers at the at the funeral. I said I really should say something in English. And then I thought to myself, I had this eureka moment. I said, you know, my bank is on Joe Biden Boulevard in Scranton. Uh, we both come from Scranton. So why don't I address it to the to the president? And then I said, "My God, I lost a son, and he's spoken often about uh, the son that he lost." So I said, "Well, we have something in common. Let me address you directly. Take the liberty." And um, I I I said that Moshe died for causes that he believes in. Uh, he believes in 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 what America is, what America should be. At least he did for many years in his career. We may differ on a lot of social issues, and but um, but he 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 believed in America. As, and Biden, as, Biden, yeah, I believe he believed in America, uh, the greatness of America. Um, I think that crosses, at least it did, party lines. Um, and uh, and and Moshe died 
for what America, the ideals that America was founded on. Um, and uh, if, God forbid, Hamas is not defeated, then uh, I mean, can we imagine for a moment that Nazism wouldn't have been defeated in 1945, where the world would be? Uh, our, our victory, and this is something I told both the prime minister and the president, I said, with all due respect, in 1945, there was no doubt in anybody's mind. I said, if you went into a bar in somewhere in Indonesia and said, you know, was Japan defeated? Was Germany defeated? They knew who the victor was and, uh, and, and who went down in flames. So the victory over Hamas has to have the same impact. Everybody's got to know that there's no more Hamas, just like there was no more Nazi Germany. And uh, I said to the president that uh, those who stand with us in this war, which is our common battle against evil, this is, this is pure, can you use the word pure? It's unadulterated evil. You know, the Nazis at least try to cover up their tracks in some cases. Uh, these people glorify. This is organized evil. This isn't just you know, an impetuous moment of, of doing something negative. This is organized evil. Or even recognizing that what you were doing is not so nice and therefore trying to pretend you weren't doing it. No, no, th th this, is, this, is, this is where we should be. This is nice. This is how we should behave. And they're, they're coming, they're coming. These, you know, w w w the unfortunate thing is you, you, you watch the media in the West and the extent of the, the sheer ignorance of people asking the questions and giving the answers is really mind-boggling. I mean, read Muslim literature, read the experts on Islam, read the thinker in the Emirates, Jamal Suwedi, who's one of the foremost experts on the Muslim Brotherhood in the world, who wrote a book about the Muslim Brotherhood, about how they kept them out of the Emirates and why the Emirates raises human beings' lives, raises the, sta the, the, the standard of living, is, a, is an oasis of, of, of camaraderie between those seven states, between those Emirates, emirate states, uh, where, where nine million out of 10 million people are immigrants from all over the world. Uh, and they, they're, a, they're a breadbasket for so many families, for millions and millions of people, because they kept the Muslim Brotherhood out. Uh, why not read that literature, understand the Muslim Brotherhood's interest in coming after the entire West, and you know, we're little Satan, America's big Satan, Europe is somewhere in between, but they're Satan. And uh, they're not gonna stop with Israel. The, 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 the battle for morality and sanity and freedom um, ends here because if we lose, then all of Western civilization loses. All civilization loses, not only Western civilization. Civilization loses. This is a battle against barbarism, the same way that Nazism just kept going and going, grabbing another piece of land after another piece of land, more people and more people until it was stopped. And this is what they will do. They will continue to grab. And, and we're, the, we're holding the fort. We're like the little kid with his finger in the dike. And uh, instead, of, instead of criticizing us, what they're basically doing, Caroline, is kicking the can down the road, as we did. Our concept... Yeah of dealing with Hamas was kick the can down the road. We kept kicking and kicking it until we ended up on the, on the 7th of October. If the United States now under President Biden uh, forces us to, to, or tries to force us, or, or themselves kicks the can down the road in dealing with radical Islam, um, it's gonna come to haunt them. Uh, and it's gonna come to haunt all of, of, of civilization. So we're in a civilizational battle. That too is something which gives me tremendous sense of solace that my son was at the forefront of this battle for what is moral, for what is ethically right, for what is true. I mean, I guess I'm not, I, I hear what you're saying, and I pray that, um, you know, the, the rational people in, in uh, the West and in Washington will, will listen and heed your words, but I fear that that's not the case. When you look at the the way that the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, have rooted themselves into the American political, strategic, academic, net academic networks. Um, and, you know, you go to your average college campus, you go to the State Department, you go to the CIA, and you you see that representatives of the Muslim Brotherhood ideology are, have actually taken 
uh, key positions in all of these very vital institutions for the well function for the functioning and the well being of of the United States and of European countries as well. Well, you're you're absolutely right. <coughs> um, look, while we were sleeping, or better than that, while we were sleeping, while we were dealing with Holocaust, Holocaust, we spent perhaps billions of dollars educating Holocaust. And while we were focused on Holocaust, because it was the only thing that united Jews around the world, um, the, the postmodernists were taking over every institution. It was their long march through the institutions. So you have an entire strata of leadership in the United States today that's brought up in these faculties, not necessarily of, of uh, Islamism, but of postmodernism, in which... Um, uh, evil and good at the beginning were interchangeable. Now they've become redefined where evil is actually good and good is actually evil. That's the slippery slope of postmodernism. Everything is totally confused and opposite. I saw this. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have too, just seeing these videos on uh, Twitter and other social media platforms. And so today there was a video that was put up by a great uh uh, Twitter account, uh, Vice Guard 25 or 24, I think is what it's called. And um, it, it, it's fantastic. Anyway, it, it had this young man speaking at a student forum at University of Cardiff, which is Wales. And uh, he was just following all of the other speakers, apparently were pro Hamas. And he came on, and as soon as he said his name was Jake, which means he's Jewish, they started booing. And uh, he tried to show his. what's the word, sympathy for um, the other side and just explaining, trying to explain that Hamas is a terrorist organization and that they're going after innocence and he was booed and, and heckled. And then one of the organizers behind the dais got up and manhandled him and forced him from the podium. And it, it was quite a quite an extraordinary video. And, and every day you see more and more of these videos of people like the school teacher in Queens at high school who was hiding in a locked office for two hours while these this mob of students were basically calling for her head and they're threatening her family. And, you know, you just, you look at that and you look at the Biden administration saying Israel needs a ceasefire or that, you know, following with the Qataris who are Hamas saying that Israel needs, uh, to, that, that their goal is to render this temporary pause to get the hostages back into a permanent ceasefire under which Hamas will survive. And so, I mean, your message is correct. The question is, how do you get that translated into a policy? Well, well first of all, the, the Jews have to begin to translate their policies differently. And all this emphasis on, you know, sympathy over the Holocaust, it's just, it's, it's, it's become absolutely nauseating. Uh, and it has- Destructive. And destructive, it hasn't accomplished anything. And we have to completely refocus. I think we're at a time of rebirth. We have to use this war uh, as a foundational experience in Jewish history. And it's almost like uh, refounding of the state. We need a new uh, social contract. Uh, it's still funny that you say that because it's almost, it's not almost, it is a message that is on the lips of almost every Israeli that I've met since October 7th. And, and you know, the people, if we were at the Shabbat dinner on Friday night and the, this man there said, got to start it all over again. And everybody is coming up with, we have to just redo it. It's got it. We knew we need a restart. We have to restart. Um, and, and so what's your, what do you mean by a new social contract? Well, I think it's time to finally put a, um, a kind of, um, contract on the table, a real, uh, consensus kind of I mean, contract. We've had a contract. The contract was we build this state yeah. and it'll never happen again. Right. And then it did. Well, her, you know, her, Herzl was a visionary in the sense that he understood that no longer could uh, Jews exist without a state. His mistake was that abnormality of the Jewish experience right. would go away once we founded a state. Um, and um, we, we need a new declaration of independence. We need a we need a, um, uh, uh, a a convention that upon which we have a refounding. I mean, we have a declaration of, of 1948, um, but uh, we, we, we need to um, 
we, we need to create, it, it's been discussed on, on, on many occasions. We just haven't actually put pen to paper. And I think there is a, a consensus uh, to create um, a, um, uh, what would we call it? Why am I drawing a blank for a moment? A social a, contract. Well, a social contract, but I mean a... Um, uh, it happens to me all the time. Just what am I thinking? Like, like what am I thinking? Like what am I thinking? It's just, just, so you think yeah. that we need a new social I think contract? It's, I think it's going to happen. The question, I think, so I think, I think, I, 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 well, you don't have to go back to some of the basics of Zionism. Because let, and, let me just, let me just, yeah. uh, since you lost your train of thought, I'll Fine. just give you one of mine. Um, but, you know, I, I made this argument a couple of weeks back, which is that, and it's not just mine, um, Professor Ellie Shikhas has also made it, which is that you know, we've gotten, there were basically two kinds of Zionism, right? There was a socialist Zionism, there was just a Zionist Zionism, like a Jewish Zionism. And the socialist Zionism said what, what Herzl believed, which was that we were abnormal, we'd get us in, we'd be normal. And the idea was that uh, Jew hatred was a product of statelessness right. and that it would go away once we got our state back. Yeah. And, um, and then when, when Israel became the new Jew and uh, Jew hatred moved, it had been, uh, you know, anti-religion and then it became, they said we were a race and they made it into anti-Semitism. And then it became anti-Zionism because we were, of course, we're a state. And so now they hate the state. Um, and uh, the socialists who thought that it was going to end became embittered and they got uh, disaffected because they said, well, hey, wait a minute, we, they still hate us. Like, that doesn't work. So Zionism failed. So we have to think of something else. And they came up with this peace idea that didn't work. And, and then it became all kinds of different things. But in, in, uh, on, on the other side, it was just, no, we just want to go home. You know, it wasn't about fixing the Jewish problem. It was we did, they, they didn't consider Judaism to be a problem that had to be fixed. It's just that they just wanted, these Jews, these Zionists just wanted to go home. Yeah. And so when, when, when uh, anti-Semitism became anti-Zionism, they just rolled with the punches because they never yeah. expected anything else. And so they were much, in a much better position to contend with reality than the people who were sure that they were going to change reality completely when they had the when they had the country, and I and I think that you know the question of a social compact is when you read the Declaration of Independence from 1948, you see that it really is an expression to have it 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 gives mouth it gives lip service to just the Jewish Zionism home. part, but it it really is an expression of the socialist Zionism mm -hmm. ethos. Yeah. Uh, so that has to change. So we, we need to we need to jump up to another level. Right. So that was that helpful? Constitution. Was that, was that yeah, helpful? yeah, yeah. We we need we need we need to finally put together a constitution, and uh, something that we uh, labor over all together, uh, labor all together. There you go. Uh, Zionism <laughs> right in there. Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. Without without intended pun. Um, no, you know the the uh, there's a there's a famous dichotomy that the philosopher Isaiah Berlin makes between positive freedom and negative freedom. You now there's positive Zionism and negative Zionism. And, and we've been heroes of the negative Zionism for a long time. Um, you know, escape the anti-Semitism, uh, home for the Jewish people and so Refuge. on. Refuge. We need, to, we need to jump to a level of positive Zionism. And that's defining what really we are all about as a people. What is it when the Jewish people come home? What is a Jewish commonwealth? This war, with all the tragedy and hurt, is helping define that. We are at the forefront of fighting evil in the world. If Jews are looking for what we're about, it's not the Holocaust Museum. What were the Jews in the Holocaust representing? And what do their heirs, the founders of the State of Israel, represent? And what do their great-grandchildren represent um, by the fact that we're at the, at the spearhead of, of fighting, of rooting out evil in the world? That's something that goes to the root, not of our army, but of our moral fiber of who we are as a nation goes back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, uh, Abraham on one side of the world and everybody else on the other. Um, that's the, what we're clarifying now. And that's what we have to come together to define. I think you're right. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that happened, I, I believe that October 7th, Simchat Torah, we hit rock bottom. Now, I mean, that was just, I think that's what rock bottom looks like. I certainly hope it is, because if there's worse than that, then 
God forbid. But um, I, I think we're starting to, uh, it, it awoke the, what are they called? The ancient courts of memory in um, Coleridge uh, poetry, but uh, that it, 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 something woke up deep inside of the Jewish soul that for many people was set aside and people just sort of woke up uh, in America, I saw uh, people wrote about how they went to bed. Uh, Douglas Murray was on the show, and he was quoting, I think, uh, what is his name, Kissin? Um, um, yeah, Constantine Kissin. Right, and he said that a lot of people went to bed uh, liberals, and they woke up conservatives, mm -hmm. and they said, I think that they went to bed woke, and they woke up Jewish. You know, and and I think it's really... Uh, I think I think that that's even far more true for Israeli Jews. A lot of them. They, I mean, we were fighting on October six, or concerned that you know the dancing and the hakafot shniot uh, for Simchat Torah that were planned for the major cities that the uh, we'd be separate. Yeah. That that people were going to protest and and break them up just like they broke up the uh, prayer on Yom Kippur in Tel Aviv and other places. And so you know there was this incredible resentment and hatred really being expressed towards Judaism, and that just disappeared overnight. And I think that... We need to capture that. Yeah. We need to capture that spirit so that it doesn't... To maintain it. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Preserve it's stand, it. Preserve it. So the day after the fighting stops, we don't go back to status quo ante. And that's why we need to work on it now. Um, so what do you suggest? Well, a number of things. I, I think we do need to, to uh, get our heads together and work on a constitution. I think we need to sit down um, and and uh, without politicians, you know, the, the the politicians of both sides create just too much antipathy. Well, there are good people among them. They want to be elected because they want to serve the people. They're they're they're, they're good. Heart. They're good. They can come back uh, at some time, but right now, the um, the the hatreds are just too deep, and we need to have a uh, you know a timeout and let people who are not uh, uh, politically involved or not i don't say politically but but political affiliation party affiliation the party affiliation is what gets everybody bent out of shape we need a period a cooling off period where we can sit down and we can talk about a new social contract a new constitu a, a constitution um that will I, I would settle for a social compact but you know go on. <laughs> yeah i i think i think uh, you know what if that's what if that's what everybody wants more than a constitution, that's too. My idea is that we do have, you know, there, there was a agreed upon constitution that was created between uh, Rabbi Maidan and uh, Ruth Gavison, a form of which needs to be uh, updated, needs to be uh, brought up to speed. Um, By the way, how's his son doing? His son, Alicia Maidan, uh, lost both legs. He was, uh, he was together with my son, Moshe. Uh, they all... They've been together, and they they would only go into battle with each other. Um, but he's doing he's doing okay um, under this. All things considered, um, uh, his life was in jeopardy for a while, but he's out of danger. But he will have two prosthetics uh, for legs. Um, but the Maidan Gavi son is a is a yeah the, is is a is a basis for. Uh, for talking, but there have to be lots of changes. I mean, look, you know, a situation where half the Jewish people continue to live outside the land of Israel, it just it, it just has to change. You know, we need to see a massive aliyah. We need to see hundreds of thousands of Jews come in aliyah. This complacency about living overseas has to go. Another complacency is people not serving in the army. This is you know this has to change. We can't have a situation where a large segment of the population chooses not to participate defending the state. It's not enough to say Psalms. You know, it's unprecedented in Jewish history that at a time of uh, 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 existential threat, uh, people choose to to not fight. Uh, it's not a Jewish idea. When there is a physical threat to the Jewish people, everybody has to be involved in that. That has to change as well. And the discourse has to change. It has to become much more uh, tolerant and congenial and less personal. We've got to leave the personal aside and focus on the ideas. You know, when push comes to shove, particularly uh, now after what happened, uh, this this awakening, as you say, and this um, uh, this Jewish awakening, there's really more that unites at the end of the day than there is that divides. 
So we got to take that, uh, crystallize it, and discuss how to differ from now on. I was looking, I'm looking at my phone. It looks like I'm interrupting you. I'm, I'm ignoring you, but I'm not. I'm looking here. This is what I was looking for. There's a, your son, Moshe, worked for the the uh, NGO that he worked for. From what I understand, it was part of Achvat Torah, the uh, Brotherhood of Torah, which is from a rabbi named uh, uh, David Label in Bnei Brock. And he's actually been... I mean, there, I think there have been 2,000 or something ultra Orthodox Jews who have joined Not in the that army. program, in, in no, but generally since speaking. The army, yes. And that for, I, I happened to meet somebody from this community. They have 240 of them all over Israel so far, but they're to integrate into Israeli, to integrate Haredi into Israeli society. And I think of the ultra Orthodox Jews who have joined the army since October 7th, they're mainly coming from his from the communities that his people have started. So, I mean, I think that you're seeing among the ultra-Orthodox also a rethinking and that there are probably people clearly within a lot of people inside of that sector of Israeli society that are also wanting to rethink their social context. There's no question. It's happening. We just, we just have to create the vehicles via which they can participate. You know, you've got some wonderful programs. They're limited in terms of funding, in terms of space, in terms of staff. All that has to grow dramatically. You have a wonderful program. Is it something program. the state has to do? Well, it has to participate. It has to participate the same way that uh, it participates in funding for universities and other programs. We need we need to help expand that. It's it's a partnership with the private sector. If you take a, a project, for example, like Code Code that Moshe uh, was in was in charge of that he um, directed. Um, so there's uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, private funding, but the government also kicks in. Uh, part of it, there's Barkai in the Golan, which is uh, connects young Haredi men with with the Air Force. Uh, they're looking to double and triple uh, their student uh, body every year. They're at 180. They want to go to 350 and then to 500. They're in line. I mean, they're, they're, people are standing in line waiting to get in. We have to help facilitate it. I agree. Uh, you know, I just before we quit, I, I just want to have you know one more thing. You were talking about how we needed to be non politicians involved in this conversation, certainly from the beginning. You just as they say in America, I have to say space where people feel comfortable. Coming to it. But um, I, I didn't go quite that far. I know, I'm not saying really, say. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I don't mean to be rude, but I, anything that reminds me of woke makes me sick. But on the other hand, we do. Um, you know, you you did work. You were chief of staff for Prime Minister Netanyahu when he was finance, finance minister, finance. and uh, you know he was. I think, uh, I mean, he he expressed great great grief and he was very genuine. Uh, when he was just talking about speaking to you about your son after he was killed and, and then came in, uh, with his wife uh, to pay a shiva call to you. And he said in his uh, press conference that uh, he had given you, uh, he had sworn to you that he was not going to lose this war. And I, and I want to ask you about that because I think everything that we're discussing, Aliyah, massive Aliyah, which definitely... Many, many people now are thinking about for the first time in, in a lot of these Western countries that are suffering profound anti-Semitism everywhere they go. Um, but we, it, it like, it, the, the, the key to all of this, you know, is that we have to win. And, you know, one of the fears that I have, particularly in relation to the IDF, but is that the people who are in charge, <laughs> the people who are in charge on October 6th and, you know, how confident do you feel that, I mean, do you believe them? Yes. When the prime minister called me, um, I was on the way to my I mean, son's I mean, Just home. if there were any spoiler alert, I, I believe them too, but uh, it's hard. So I want to hear from you. Yeah, I agree with you. It's hard. Um, certainly after the the collective errors that were made leading up to October 7th. But... Um, you know, when the prime minister called, I said, um, I'm asking you. And, and then I changed it and I said, I'm demanding that my son's death will not be in vain. Uh, you have to not win the war. You have to destroy Hamas. And uh, it's going beyond just winning the war. We can win, but it has to be, as I said before, a, a, a win without any doubt in anyone's mind. And it's the destruction of Hamas. 
And he chose to say, he chose the wording. He says, I swear to you that I won't stop until they're destroyed. And you know, we both know the prime minister. He chooses his words very carefully. And when he came to the shiva call together with his wife and uh, uh, his uh, entourage, I reminded him and I, I said very clearly that, you know, you, you uh, choose your words carefully. And he said, well, I'm going to repeat it. I, I swear to you that I will not stop until Hamas is eliminated. And um, I believe that he will do everything he possibly can to make that happen. I think he has a, you know, I, I have many hours with um, his father, Ben Sion Netanyahu. <laughs> and, and one thing that came across in every conversation with him was the uh, 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 existential issue of Jewish existence. You know, he used to say, he said, he say, Jews didn't survive. It's a, it's a mistake in the, in the syntax. We didn't survive for 2,000 years. We died. You know, we, a fraction of us survived. I still, I hear uh, him screaming this to me. We, he, so said, we, he said, we have, we have a problem with our survival instinct. And that's something that he drilled into his sons. And I, I think that uh, Bibi is, um, maybe some of his mistakes as prime minister, vis-a-vis, various security issues were actually um, deployed because of his unifocus on the big question of Iran and survival. And there may have been some cues along the way that were overlooked because they didn't appear to be existential at the time. It's just a theory that I'm throwing out to you, Caroline, but I, I, I think it it might, might be the case. I also think that the, there um, were a whole series of mistakes made over 15 years by many governments and by many different uh, uh, senior officers. And I think that those in charge right now, chief of staff uh, down, to, down to the battalion commanders, um, you, you sense it. You sense it in, in, when you read between the lines uh, of their remarks and the way the army is operating. I mean, this is this is a very professional way that they're proceeding. I say that after having lost a son, um, they are uh, in in uh, there's there's a pace, uh, a very concerted pace. The uh, um, they're operating in concert. We've never had uh, an operation where battalion commander or even a squadron commander talks directly. To the helicopter or the attack helicopter above him and uh the, the the level of communication is so professional is so tight uh that uh i i think that the, the there's determination coming from uh, all corners of the army and i think that if um i mean we hear it from the soldiers coming back even for short visits but think about it i mean my, my sons-in-law for example they they came out this shabbat for the first time for a few hours and they're running right back and, and, and that's the story with all of their soldiers. And I've been spending my uh, week after the Shiva visiting the homes of, of, uh, of fallen soldiers, the families. Um, that's part of my therapy. You know, I joined a big family of what we call the Shchol, you know, the, the, and, uh, and it's the same wherever, wherever you go, uh, whatever sector the population, this has to be completed. This is a war against evil. This is what we're here for. This is what we're in this world here. This is what the Jewish people are all about. We contend with evil. We defeat it. We've done it in the past. We're about to celebrate Hanukkah for crying out loud. It's not just a holiday of nice little lights and donuts and presents. You know, it's not a Santa Claus holiday. This is the, as defeating evil. That's what it was all about, about lighting light when there's darkness. And sometimes, you know, fire does two things. If we're on the, just a few weeks from Hanukkah, a few days from Hanukkah, fire does two things. It illuminates and it consumes. And sometimes to illuminate, you have to consume, you have to fight a war. That's the essence of Hanukkah. We're about to consume the evil in order to light a big flame that will uh, illuminate the world with morality. Well, that's, uh, I, think, I think that's a good place to end this story. I think you're absolutely right. Again, I should have had you on a while ago on this show, well before any of this, because you're a profound thinker and you have a lot to offer. And I'm sorry that the thought of having you on, Yechiel, came to me when I was sitting with you uh, to mourn your son. Um, you said here in this 
conversation and you, and you said it also repeatedly at the Shiva that I visited and also some of the stories that I saw you had said, uh, you know, that we're, that you're now, you know, you, you were always the son of, we think of ourselves as by our forefathers and now you're, you're Moshe's father. And, um, but he's your son. And, and I'm sure he was, he, he felt privileged to be your son. He just says you're privileged. And do you know, as my, my sister would always say, uh, you don't get apples from banana trees. Well, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, you know, one of his, uh, probably his closest friend, had the most comforting remark for me, just as the shiva was ending. I had, uh, he had heard me say several times during the shiva that my last meeting with Moshe was at the training base as they were preparing to go in. And uh, he gave me what you call, and I, ha I, I only saw him for about 30 seconds, and he gave me what you call in Yiddish a knippenbeckel, you know. He, he, um, he, squeezed, he squeezed my cheek, and he gave me, you know, a little potch, and he said, everything's going to be okay. And um, his dear friend said to me that he thinks that any possible lingering separation between father and son was then removed. So that's very consoling. It is consoling, and it's also heartbreaking. Do you guys do you know, we're blessed to have you. So we're blessed to have you, and uh, we should just take lessons from his life Make sure that we do have that new awakening and a new social compact and constitution to this country. And I'm sure that you'll play a pivotal role in authoring this next chapter of Jewish history. So I thank you for joining me. And um, Thank you for having me, Caroline. It's an opportunity to thank you for all your important work in yes. getting, in getting, in getting the word out to so many thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. And well, billions. we're going there. We're moving on. We're moving forward. We're moving forward. All right. Well, thank you very much. And guys, we'll see you again soon uh, on the Caroline Lake Show. Take care. <laughs>